renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I think it really goes without saying that uh, we're living in a world in which we are being crushed. We're living in a world in which there is perplexity outside the church of God, inside the church of God. But thank God for Jesus Christ, we don't give up in despair. Because we have Jesus with us. And what we suffer in this life that is temporary, God is going to make up so much more in the life that is eternal. So this morning, I want to base my remarks to you on, on three basic things from this chapter. And the one is the world in which we live. It's a picture of despair. It's a picture of tragedy. It's a, it's a picture that really tests the fibre of every Christian man and woman today. And your faith in the message as Christians. And the Seventh Day Adventists in, in particular. So the first thought here, the world as we see it today I was reading um, some years ago the book Councils on Health. Wonderful book. It's a compilation. Wonderful book. And I thought this was going to be on health. But the first chapter or so is not on health, if you remember. It's on the world scene and what God's children are facing today. And it says this, 20, chapter 25, uh, page 25, we're living in the midst of an epidemic of crime at which thoughtful, God-fearing people everywhere stand aghast. Isn't that true? If it is true back there, in the 1890s or so, it is even more true today. Every day brings fresh revelations of political strife, bribery, and fraud. Every day brings its heart-sickening record of violence and lawlessness, of indifference to human suffering, of brutal, fiendish destruction of human life. Every day. Hey, that's, the, that's our newspapers, isn't it? Not in quiet little New Zealand. Don't you believe it? In New Zealand. It's not the country we knew at one time. 
every day testifies to the increase of insanity, murder, and suicide. Who can but doubt that satanic agencies are at work among men and women with increasing activity to distract and corrupt the mind and to defile and to destroy the body. How true that is. What a picture. What a tragic picture. And that's what Paul is really talking about here. Just think, you know, he enumerates and acts all the things he went through. But let me tell you, they're nothing compared to what is happening in our society today and the wickedness and the evil. This is what Daniel saw as the time of what? The end. There's no doubt about it, brothers and sisters. This is the time of the end. But you know, I just don't want to pause there here. I want to state something else. In the midst of the sickening society, there's hope. There's not hope in the way that mankind thinks it would come today by man's intellect and uh, inevitable uh, progress, as they say in society, but it's only in God's way. This is very important for us to realize. There, the reason of this sickening society is that men and women have made themselves the only yardstick in life. Never in any other generation in history have we been deluged with the evolutionary concepts of life. Man has made himself the, the, the arbiter of his destiny and the, he measures uh, everything in, in, in nature and the world by his own yardstick. And that's why the world is out of joint. We have brought it on ourselves. But the picture is not hopeless. That's the second thing I want you to, to realize. I want us to capture this morning the picture of Jesus. Jesus is in control. And he does not view with all that he sees happening in our world it as hopeless. She says, the world is out of joint. And as we look at the picture, the outlook seems discouraging. But Christ greets with hopeful assurance the conditions that cause us discouragement. Isn't that good? Jesus Christ has a different view, a different picture of our situation. The brightness of the Savior's view of the world will inspire confidence. There we go. Look at Jesus. Get his picture. Christ's heart is cheered by the sight of those who are poor in every sense of the word. Cheered by the ill-used ones who are meek. Cheered by the seemingly unsatisfied ones who are hungering and searching for righteousness. When the light of the world passes by, privileges appear in all hardships, order in confusion, the success and wisdom of God in that which seemed to be failure. So that's what I want you to grasp this morning. I want you to grasp the picture as Jesus sees it. Men and women looking wistfully to heaven for something better. He'll answer their cry. He'll answer 
and meet their every need. And it comes in this way. She gives the way that we're to do it. Yes, we're to preach these wonderful truths. We're to be given. Brethren and sisters, the older I get, the more I study into the Word of God, we have been blessed with a wonderful, wonderful message. No question about it. And... Um, It'll come, this view of Jesus will come as you and I, all of us, come close to Jesus ourselves. That's the answer. Come close to him, open our hearts to him, ask every day for an infilling of his Holy Spirit to control us, to steady us, to balance us, to help us to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us. And a second thing is, my brothers and sisters, this is page 26 now, in your ministry, come close to people. It is in giving that we receive. But come close to people. Get close to people. Now, Ken, she's saying this first and foremost to pastors. But aren't we all pastors? We had a, a brother here this morning that was dedicated to the ministry of serving. Not here, only here in the church, but in a wider capacity in society. He's a deacon in society, a son of God to minister. Look at Philip. He was ordained as a deacon. But my, he went out preaching Jesus Christ, didn't he? He baptized. Pastor, he even baptized that Ethiopian man in that pool of water. What a wonderful thing for you and I to take seriously that you, that we are ministers of Jesus Christ. And in that ministry, come close to people. Don't, don't stay within our comfort zone. Get out of our comfort zone. And when you meet somebody on the way, strike up a conversation. Talk to people. Share with some of these people. You know, I... I, I think it was God's, um, God's, uh, what can you say, timing when uh, Owen and I were down on the Greenstone, hiking the Greenstone down the South Island, eight weeks ago, nine, nine weeks ago. In the morning, we happened to come uh, uh, to meet three fellows coming the opposite way on the trail. And um, we stopped, and I don't know who started the conversation, but we started a conversation with these three fellows as they stopped with us there. And, uh, and I, as, as we were all talking together, and one of them shared that he, oh yeah, he'd been up to Seattle. Uh, he'd been... Um, gone up to, on the inside passage up to Alaska in a boat on a cruise with Bill Gaither family. Any of you heard of the Bill Gaither family? So that was a little clue to us. Hey, Christians, you know? And uh, it went from one thing to another. And then I said, just before departing, I said to one of the fellas, you remind me, you remind me of... Um, uh, a friend of mine down in the little uh, town of Aria by the name of Dark. And he said, really? I said, you look like him. You really do. And he said, I know him. I know him. And uh, uh, then he went on to say that his father had ministered in that area as so kind of like a, a lay Sunday school pastor, you know, 
and he knew some of the people that we knew. And uh, then, uh, then he said, you know, there's always blessings both ways. Then he said, um, he saw that my eyes were, were watering, you know. And it wasn't because of, oh, I was emotionally wrought at all. But uh, it's just that I have a problem at times. When I get in the cold uh, in the morning, uh, my, my tear ducts overflow. And uh, it's, it's, it's annoying to say the least. But he said to me, he said to me, um, you know, I used to have that problem of the tears flowing. And he said, I went to surgery, in, and they, they've done the surgery down in, in Wanganui, and he said, it's, it just takes care of it like that. So I thanked him for that, you know, and uh, then we went on our way. But we'd found the name. But we'd got outside of our comfort zone, outside of our blanket, and started to, to talk. Well, I come back here to uh, Griff's funeral, and suddenly the names of those guys come to my mind. Uh, I couldn't remember whether it was Whiteside or White End or, or uh, White Lock or whatever. It's White something, you know? And so I looked in the telephone book, and... Um, there I saw the names, Nelson and Ernie Whitelock. So I said, I'm going to call them up and find a little bit more about, um, about that surgery, what it's called, and so on. So he wasn't home. But I got his brother, and his brother said he'd be coming back on Tuesday. So I got his, Ernie's telephone number in Wanganui, and... Uh, then uh, finally I, I tried many times on Tuesday, couldn't get him. And then Wednesday, finally made contact. And what a good contact it was. He explained to me the surgery, you know, and um, uh, what it's called and, and all the procedure about it and who is the fellow that does it down there and the doctor. And then he said to me, Gary, what do you do? What should I told him? I told him I'm a, a pastor. I've ministered in Seattle. And uh, he said, well, what I want to know then, what denomination do you belong to? <laughs> I said to him, and I always, I'm, listen, brother, and sister, I'm not proud about it, but I am so grateful to be able to share that I belong to the body of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he said, well, he said, isn't that wonderful? He said, I highly respect Seventh-day Adventists. Now, that's not the end of the story yet, is it? Because he said to me, whenever you come back, Gary, you have a bed to stay in our house. And by the grace of God, I'm going to be able to share with him in his house. And uh, then as we parted, I said to him, I said to him, Ernie, you know, we hope to meet again. But if not, do you know, Ernie, where we're going to meet? And he says, when Jesus comes again. Isn't that good? Yes. And so get out of our comfort zone. Learn to be able to, to reach out and, and, and talk with people and get close to people. That's where it's at, isn't it, Pastor? Absolutely. Getting close to people. Uplift those who are cast down. Treat calamities as disguised blessing, blessings. Woes as mercies. That's putting it in the right perspective, isn't it? That's where God wants it to be. Work in a way that will cause hope to spring up in place of of despair. And so, brothers and sisters, God's picture is so different to our picture, and I'm glad it is. And God wants us, you and me, to be the bearers of that kind of, of positive message in a world that is out of joint. I think, in closing, 
that this is the beautiful message that God would want us to give. You know, it is as if the demons of Satan are stirring up our world to destruction. But who is in control? Jesus is in control. God will have his way. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we get a little bit impatient. We say, Lord, why haven't you come in my lifetime? You know, when the eyes start to fail and the hair starts to fall out. You know, and we get those aches and pains and we can't walk, walk with with vigor like youth in me anymore, and we say, Lord, what are you doing? God's timing is the best timing, brothers and sisters. And even though Daniel said, God, I don't understand, he says that again in chapter 12, I don't understand, God. God says, I have a plan my plan will be fulfilled. But Daniel, you're going to have to be patient. And some of you, like Daniel, are going to, we're going to have to hear the words, go to rest. Go to rest. With the knowledge that my plan will be fulfilled. And the beautiful picture is, that even though Satan is working his worst in humanity, there are men and women who are looking to heaven, who haven't known what you and I know, but God is guiding and leading them. And who knows? God may have us to be the one to help them in their need. You know, I look at this uh, story here, and this is, this is um, bring you to a close now here. Open your Bibles again. This is, this is a beautiful um, story about what Jesus did. Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And I want us to go here to chapter 8. And this is right after... Jesus' experience of the wind uh, uh, and the boat on the water. You remember when they said, Lord, save us, we perish. Remember that? This is right after that. Uh, verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is, in, which is opposite Galilee. And when he had stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. He wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine were feeding there on the mountain. And they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran down violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who, saw them, who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and, and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had, been, had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. 
that they were afraid. Verse 39 Um, No, I'm sorry. Let's let's go on verse 36. They also who had seen it told them by what means he had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him, that he may, may be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Now, having told you that, I want to add a little bit. Notice there it says, Jesus said, return to your own, what? House. The other gospel accounts don't don't have that. Just Luke. There was a, a Welsh, a Welsh revivalist about the time just after John Wesley by the name of Christmas Evans who had just one eye. And he zeroed in this, on this in one of his sermons and he said, imagine that former destructive demon-possessed man come, coming back home, but now in his right mind. And the little children outside the house are playing. And the little children see their dad the one who had beaten them, the one who had abused them, the one who was out of his mind and crazy, coming back and they say, he's back again. He's back. And they run into their house and tell their mother. And the mother looks out and she sees, sees this man coming. And she says to the children, quick, quick, lock the door, pull the shades, Get the drapes closed. That evil man is coming back to torment us. And all is quietness and they listen to that man coming. They thought that he would do the same as he had done before. He would break down the door and come into the house and abuse them again. But this time it's different. There is just the knock of the door. And Christmas Evans says, um, he calls out in a voice and says, Mary, Mary, I want to come in. I'm not the same man that I was before. Something's happened. Something's happened to me. I'm healed. I've met Jesus and a miracle has taken place. Brothers and sisters, do you believe in miracles? Every one of you sitting here this morning is a miracle of God's grace. Did you know that? We are told that God surrounds the earth through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit by an atmosphere of what? Grace. And God's grace is not only his forgiveness, but God's grace is his power to deliver and to help us, we human beings, in our desperate need and our fight over sin and Satan. And so the good news is, Jesus creates a miracle in you and I. And I still believe, brothers and sisters, that to everyone who gives themselves to Jesus, there is a work done in heart and soul and mind and body. It's a marvelous thing what Jesus does. 
That's why we come close to Jesus. He is the only one who can help us with the despair in our society. He's the only one who can change this human heart. And as we come close to people, people will experience a beautiful transformation of heart and life as we introduce them to Jesus. He is the Saviour. He is the light of the world. And he, if he be lifted up, will draw all men to him. So the scene is not hopeless, brothers and sisters. This temporary existence will pass away and Jesus will have a rich reward from this little rebel planet. Never forget it. And so this morning again, as you've heard many times before, I recommend Jesus to you. The hope of the world. And ask him to keep that beautiful, clear, bright picture. Jesus' vision of the world before you. And ask him to give you a new message, a mission every day that you live of doing something to reach out and to draw others to Jesus. You know, last time, brother, we talked about your daughter in England. That's a ministry for you and your wife. Their daughter's England, in England. And just surround them with prayer every day with that little daughter in England. My boy's up in Seattle. You know, your children here in, in Vongarei. Give them to Jesus every day. Uplift them. Don't fail in your prayers because Jesus will give a victory and have a beautiful harvest in his quickly coming kingdom. And we want, brothers and sisters, our children to be with us, don't we? Everyone is precious in his sight. And so may God bless this church. Every time I come back, I see new faces. God is still leading and talking and wooing people through his Holy Spirit, and it's beautiful. So continue the good work and give God the praise and the honor and the glory. All right, we're going to sing hymn number 520, He Hideth My Soul. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. And we'll sing all four stanzas of this hymn.
Our dear Father in heaven, we recommit ourselves to Jesus this morning. It's our great privilege to do so. And Lord, without reservation, we ask you to come in through your Holy Spirit and seal us as your children. Prepare us, Lord, for the days ahead. Prepare us for your quickly coming kingdom. And then when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we'll give you all the praise and the glory throughout all eternity. Please keep this family flock in Wangarei. Keep the light burning in their lives, Lord. Give them, Lord, each day the opportunities to reach out and to touch somebody and to love somebody to the feet of Jesus. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless this congregation. Unite their hearts. May there be one clear, momentous message going forth from this church. May it be all to the honour and glory of God, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.